I said, you know, we spoke a little bit about this at the opening at the Motorgate uh, just a few, about an hour ago, but just to repeat it, you know, the editors of Clog World, designers, architects, um, editors, people interested in design, and for us, Roosevelt Island really does represent a pretty unique and amazing place. It's so it's such a hopeful place, a place that 40 years ago there was really no one living here. And it's starting with the Lindsay administration of incredibly forward-thinking policies, that this actually became a real community. And it's changed over time, we all know that, and there's people who, it's amazing talking to people who live here about how it has changed. But, you know, just it, down to the, the way the planning, obviously, which is what we would consider to be brutalist, um, which Michael will talk a bit more, and that's an obvious reason for why we would have this particular issue launched here, but also as a place that is just representation of the best that architecture and planning can possibly do sometimes, right? Uh, there's so few chances we really have a tabula rasa and you create a new community. In this case, it's a small town in the Middle East River. And that extends both through the design and the inhabitation of the island through the trash collection, right? Which is this nomadic system that doesn't exist anywhere else in the U.S. as far as I know, maybe one other place. Disney um, World has it. Disney World has it, that's right. <laughs> somewhere in Scandinavia, right? Um, but it's amazing to see how it's grown over 40 years and it's changing. Also, frankly, we're very interested as practitioners and how it will change in the next four years. And seeing things like Riva and the Motorgate Gallery and the life that is in this island that's infused with and development that is taking place here today, it's inspiring to see that that, that spirit that began four years ago still continues. And um, we're all very excited to be part of that. And also we just want to thank Riva and everyone on the island for hosting us here today. So that, in short, uh, summarizes why we were here. I should also add that one of our contributors, who I think just stepped up, a Christian Johansson, his father designed the building that we're sitting in today. He's an architect. I don't know if some of you got to meet him. He's walking around here. And um, so there's a lot of personal connections, actually, between the issue itself and the island, which is another reason why he wanted to be here. Now I'll hand it over to Michael, who will talk about brutalism. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm tasked with talking not, not only about brutalism, but why brutalism now, um, and why also why. Why you're our guest editor. Why are you our guest editor? Yeah. Okay. In two minutes. So. <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, okay. I want to say thank you to these guys for inviting me. Um, why I'm qualified um, is I actually run a photo blog um, on a, a social networking site called Tumblr um, on brutalism. Um, What's it called? It's called A Dirty Word, Yeah, Brutalism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always embarrassed to say that in public. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been doing it for about two years. Uh, just recently, about a week ago, accrued my 100,000th follower, um, which is sort of incredible for such a sort of um, marginal topic as brutalism. Um, no, I don't need a round of applause. So that's part of my qualification. Um, I, I study, the, study the history of architecture, um, specifically the period that brutalism occurred in, the post-war period um, in America. And um, uh, what else do I need to talk about? Uh, brutalism. What do you think? <laughs> so what's, what is brutalism? What is brutalism? Um, Why is brutalism, this brutalism? I think, I, I was asked earlier what the distinction is between modernism and brutalism. And I think it's a really good question and one that's pretty appropriate to answer in this forum. Um, I think, um, personally, that the distinction between brutalism and modernism comes down to their use of materials and their revealing of materials. Um, brutalism amplified um, the interest that was sort of embedded in modernism in, in honesty, in a sort of um, clarity about what buildings were made of, and, and a sort of ethic about that. Um, and I think that's sort of, the distinction between those two um, comes down to that, the sort of use of materials. Um, and it was widespread, that tendency, um, across the world. Um, we're seeing the evidence of it here, um, but I think you can also find the evidence in Shandigar, India, which we're seeing in the photographs. Um, that was a sort of, some people have cited as the sort of birthplace of brutalism. Um, the architect Le Corbusier uh, designed an entire city, a capital city, for, um, for part of India, um, and revealed the materials, sort of um, a baton bru, which is a, a, a clear um, forward use of reinforced concrete. Um, and that tendency sort of propagated and became a worldwide thing. Um, uh, I don't know. Does that work? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Any questions? Yes. <laughs> what about or any of us? Would you consider him a brutalist? 
Uh, I think it sort of depends on the project. Um, it's, it's, do, do, you consider, struggle we do, do you consider the Georges Pompidou Center in Paris as a part of the late <laughs> brutalism? It's a really interesting question. I think that's a pretty controversial question. Um, <laughs> Uh, typically, that would be categorized under something else, so something called high tech. But, yeah. but I think you're right. The, the way I described it, it's it's a, a further ampli amplification of those tendencies. So it's an interesting question. Yes. How about Brasilia? Brasilia got cut out of this issue, actually. Yeah. 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 This is a very difficult thing for us as editors, <laughs> is to draw lines yeah. and to actually figure out, like, what are we going to say is brutalism and what isn't? And yeah, I mean, it's such a tough, it's, obviously it's, it's a really tough category to define, challenging, right? Because yeah. there was the it's, earlier New Brutalism, which was much more, like, which was very English, and it was about stripped down, which really doesn't look like anything we're in right now, right? And then it became much more about stripped down modernism that was very honest. And then that was more about an ethic in many ways, right? And then it became something that's been applied to many projects since. So there's the jury's out on actually what defines brutalism. That's one of the challenges we've had to deal with as editors of this particular issue. Well, the word reminds you of Stalin. And sure. I, I think you yeah. didn't mean that. Yeah. Well, we didn't name it. <laughs> um, it's a yeah. It's a it's a word that's been used since the fifties, and, and um, I don't know. I think we're sort of. But not. This, I, I would never consider connection between Stalin and brutalism. Brutal. You can buy the great perfume. Which is called brutal. It's with the strength, with the yes. <laughs> so, so I, I think it's a much more sophistication in the brutalism than a just pure uh, annotation that oh, somebody who is powerful that's a brutal. I, I think, I think we have a nice example of this big yellow. Uh, Pipes sticking out in the middle of the main street, painted in yellow, painted in orange. I think this is part of the brutalistic approach. It means exposing what other styles or tendencies were trying to hide. Also, the honesty, as you were saying, in architecture, in, construct, in structure, using the material without gold leafing the concrete or putting the wood ceiling over, uh, we don't need it. So. I think a really good point to keep in mind is that a lot of people think of brutalist buildings because a lot of them were built during a period from the you know, 60s, 70s, and then weren't maintained, that they think of them as incredibly harsh, rough places, when actually a lot of those buildings had very intentionally soft, colorful, uh, contrasting interiors with their concrete exterior. And actually, I was just given before this, you know, this event here, I was just given a tour of the building we're in today, right now, this moment, um, the lobby behind us. And it's beautiful. It's and it's so beautiful. Really you should get that tour. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it really shows you, actually, and that's one thing that really impresses us about the island, is that it, brutalism is not just, it's not just a museum piece. It's actually alive. It's been maintained. It's lived in here. And you can see in this building in particular, just if you go behind this wall, there's when you go into a lobby that has these beautiful you know, yellow tile walls and orange tile walls, and the color contrasts with the concrete and with the wood, and it really is what brutalism is always supposed to be. And um, you may call that brutalism, you may call it something else, but it, we think it's beautiful and uh, kind of an interesting. So, I have a question. Does brutalism have to do with scale at all? I'm across the street, and we used to be called Eastwood, and I think we have a thousand and one units in this building. I've never been in such a big building. Is brutalism usually like large scale, or is that coincidental? Not necessarily. No, I don't know. I think. Um, for me, it's not necessarily about scale. I think the, the, the thing that happened in the 60s is a lot of sort of public institutions were commissioning buildings, um, both sort of mayoral um, administrations and also the governments, the, the sort of federal government and things like that. Um, so yeah, the style is a sort of associated with large buildings. But um, it's the material, not the size. Um, according to us, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, have you been to Blackwell School across the street? Uh, the Josie Louis Serrett Little School? Yeah. I haven't been there yet. I haven't been that to that. No. no? no. I'd love to. That too. Yeah, can. I would think of classic <laughs> examples. <laughs> Jose, uh, Jose Serrett who designed yeah. the Eastwood and also Westview. Yeah. I have a question, and this is a very important question for <laughs> the entire the uh, community on Roosevelt yeah. Island. And, and please be honest, maybe you are not ready to answer it. There is a 
arcade on the east view. There is arcade on the west view. Uh, recently, there are some architects who are taking care of the main street, and they are trying to erase all this glass partition. Also erase the small uh, walls connecting those columns. They did the mock-up in the end of the East. Please see it and let us know your comments about it. Uh, it's quite important. I have very clear mind about uh, what to think about it, but I will not share it with you. <laughs> but if you can help us with, with your point of view about that, we are living on Roosevelt Island, we are walking over there, we use it on everyday basis. You are guests, so maybe you can... There's a question for you, as a resident of Roosevelt Island, do you, use, do you find those arcades useful? Yes. Extremely. Yes. 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 We all do. We all do. <laughs> That probably matters more than our opinion about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, frankly, I mean, you know, we're not, I don't think any of us are inch, would be able to, you know, quick to critique another architect's design not even having seen it. But um, it's a, you know, yeah, yeah. but I'd say that if you use it, appreciate it. You know that the demolition of all those, that glass is going to start in three weeks. This is your last chance. If anybody objects to it, to contact Raya or whoever it might be. You are on the spot. <laughs> no, I mean, that's. Yeah. You left us hanging on why it's important to address realism now. Why now? Okay. Um, a smarter person than me um, once told me that there's a sort of circular interest in architectural history around. 25 or 30 years. Um, brutalism's sort of late for that. Um, and so I think it, it what we find um, as sort of young architects so refreshing about it is both its scale, which yes, I think scale is important, um, but also the, the, the amount of um, sort of institutional attention that was paid to architecture. Um, we don't find the same attention paid to aesthetics or to design um, in governmental institutions or, or universities or anything like that. Um, and it's sort of openness to aesthetic experimentation that happened in the 60s with brutalism. And so I think um, we're looking back on it and we want that. You know, We want to have those opportunities. Also, I mean, there's a, a preservation crisis right now with a lot of these buildings that they turn 50 or so, and um, a lot of communities are saying, we need to tear down this ugly concrete building. And they don't know what they have, or they, you know, there's maintenance issues, things haven't been maintained, and that's used as an excuse to rip down a building. So um, the brutalist conversation has kind of crept up because of that as well. Yeah, so, I mean, Kyle had an excellent piece in this latest issue where we actually examined how you would build a brutalist building now versus, you know, back in the 50s. And right, the fact is, you really, a lot of these buildings really couldn't build this way today. And, you know, it's before we start tearing them all down, which they're coming into threat, it would be a real shame if they disappeared before, you know, just because they're seen as out of fashion at the moment, right? Um, and there are a lot under threat, yeah. including the arcade up in front of our building right now. Like we didn't know too much, but now we all the stuff we have. We love it because we love it. It was functional and on the island for 27 years, and I used to live on the east side, and it was beautiful walking in, you know, the, the shelter from the rain and snow, and was 